quite a lot of me this morning, aren't you? <laughs> uh, what a joy it was to hear Jan's voice for a change. That's great. Um, so, the harvest is plentiful, but few are chosen. I'll give you nine words to start with. God is light. God is love. God is life. And they're words that were spoken in 1942, but you're directly connected with them this morning. They were words that were spoken by a guy called Alfred Schweitz in 1942. He was a German pastor in exile from uh, Germany during the war. And he gave a talk to a bunch of 16-year-olds in a school, among which my dad was there. Came out of a non-Christian family, but he was so moved he gave his life to Jesus that way. With those simple words and a simple talk in broken English, God is light, God is life, God is love. And that's had an amazing effect, hasn't it? It's had an amazing effect on my life. I've been fortunate enough to be raised uh, by my father, and here I am today sharing that. But let's take this a bit further. Press on, and in the last month or so, a young man called Josh has stood up in, um, in a church predominantly to farmers in a barn in Devon, and he offered prophetic words of insight based on a, de- a gift that he developed uh, in his time as a young Christian, 18 years old. Josh had been mentored since he was 13 by my son, and my son had been brought up and mentored by me, who was brought up and mentored by my father, who heard those words, God is love, God is life, God is light. The gospel is a powerful thing, friends. Sometimes we simply need to be faithful with the circumstances we're in and how and when we share it with whoever we are. And it's incredible, the cascade. We, we, bring, the, we bring the seed and then God brings the harvest in. The harvest is plentiful. But the challenge is this, that the workers are few. Father God, I help us as we ponder this mystery that you call us your harvest workers that you have done an incredible thing. You've opened up the gateway to paradise, as we remembered on Ascension Day, and then you turned and said, all power and authority is given to you, therefore we should go. So as we think on this, Lord, I pray that you will open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to celebrate your calling on us today. The harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Jesus was talking to his disciples. Did you see that? And, And Matthew gives a nice little list. And Jesus is aggrieved. He says, these people, there's so many, they're like sheep without a shepherd. They've got no direction, no care. Of course, he's talking spiritually. He's looking out over Judah and Israel and saying, this is just catastrophic. What is going to happen here? And the first thing he does is to draw these disciples together. And first question is then, when when Jesus says, the Lord of the harvest, ask the Lord of the harvest, who is he talking about? Because it's kind of mysterious, but actually it's really quite clear. Because earlier in the same gospel, John himself, uh, Matthew himself, talks about John the Baptist, who points to Jesus and says, look, the winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And from the very earliest stage, that image of harvest is right there. It's actually an ancient image that goes back centuries, but right now it's been given to Jesus himself. John's pointing out, this is the Lord of the harvest. He is the root by which the world is going to be harvested and lives are going to be saved. So there is Jesus now saying to his apostles, I'm giving you authority. I'm saying, um, you pray, you ask, you say, Lord, we need disciples, we need senders, we need people to go and bring in this harvest of yours. But in the very next breath, Jesus is saying, I'm giving you authority, you're the guys that are going to do it. He then, I don't know if you notice, it goes very quickly from disciple to apostle, almost within a breath. Almost within a breath, it kind of goes click from Therefore, ask the Lord to send out harvest workers. And almost instantly, the disciples become the answers to their own prayers. Do you see that? As soon as they say, well, this is something that needs to be done. Who's going to do it? Jesus then says, therefore, go. I'm sending you out. And he gives them authority to do the most extraordinary supernatural things. But it is a template for what we can also be called to do. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to go and send workers. I'm authorizing you. Now you go. 
That word apostle, they get turned into apostles. It's a very spiritual biblical word, isn't it? But it's actually an ancient word which everybody understood at the time. There was all kinds of people that the Greeks used to send. They're basically ambassadors. There's stories of people being sent 300, 400 years BC as envoys or ambassadors on diplomatic missions. They were apostles. Even in the the province of Judah, the Greek word for the people that the high priests would send to go and gather temple taxes was apostles. There were these ambassadors, they represented people, and then they were sent as representatives, just like our modern day ambassadors. Greek word apostello means to send. So God has conferred that privilege on these people. And again, I say, just note those two things. What starts off as ask very quickly turns into, actually, I'm sending you. And also, it is a seamless transition. It's not kind of like, well, wait until the time is right. Jesus hasn't got time to wait. Jesus says, okay, you've prayed. You've agreed this is a problem. You've called God to send harvest workers. Why don't you be the first to do this? And the reality is actually these apostles, these 12 disciples, are only doing what Jesus has done. We read this earlier in verse 35, that he's already been to the cities and villages. He's gone ahead, he's prepared the way. And this is also the reality of us when we're called to do what Jesus is calling us to do. Say, I'm not asking you to do anything I haven't done. But then it opens up all those incredibly moving and powerful and slightly scary scriptures. If anyone wants to follow me, they will have to take up their cross. Take the same route as I did. You disciples, you're going to take the same route as I did. You're going to start off going back to these cities and villages. Now let's turn our thoughts to Merstham. I can't w- miss an opportunity to talk about Merstham. Um, just in case you hadn't heard, we felt extremely convinced uh, over the last years, particularly months and even more so weeks, that God is asking us as a church to go and help equip and resource the churches in Merstham. And it's nothing new, let me tell you. It was around 40 years ago that St. Catharines in Merston felt so aggrieved about the lack of church presence, they planted a church called Epiphany Church, right in the heart of where the estate is in Merston. And then Red Hill Christian Fellowship, I met a man called Paul Pusey, I think many people here know him, fantastic brother in Christ, who actually planted with Red Hill Christian Fellowship about 20 years ago. And I was also chatting to Mark Cope over in Christ Central in Red Hill. They also feel very strongly called to go and help. And why is it then that we feel also that we're called to join in? Why is it that we feel that we need to get a group of apostles, sent ones from St. Mary's, to also do this ancient task of helping to declare the, the kingdom, to teach, to encourage, to proclaim the good news? Well, let me try and give give an argument for why I think we should and why I'm so sure that we should. I get to look at the registers, and I think this is a pretty typical day, not a bad day in St. Mary's for a sunny day. So well done, thanks for being here. But as you look around, there are about twice as many people in this room as there are people in the few small churches in Merstham, just in this room, yeah? Isn't that incredible? And of course, this is just the morning service today. There's then the people who aren't here this Sunday because they are elsewhere. I'm not a judge, am I? But it is in my mind. I wonder where they are. And then there's the 8.30 service. And then there's the evening service. And then there's the Heath Church. I make that about five times the number of Christians associated with with, with, um, with St. Mary's and the Heath Church as there are in Merston churches today. And then there's the Methodist church. You can add them on. Let's, let's keep that. So we're now up to five. And then remember that Merstham is actually three parishes, G- Gatton, South Merstham, and then the main Merstham uh, area. And they're roughly about twice the number in terms of their overall uh, number of people uh, just generally living in the, in the communities in Merstham. So friends, I make that a ratio of almost 10 to 1 in terms of what we have as church presence here and what the church presence is in Merstham. So this isn't a vanity project. This isn't like St. Mary's going, oh, wouldn't it be great? We're the big guys on the hill with a lovely big church and we're going to go along and be goody two-shoes and and be very proud of everything that we're doing. I actually think it's quite the opposite. I think, why have we waited so long? Why have have, have we enjoyed being in community and we see many, many good things happening, but why has it taken us so long to not go and go, well, how can we bring who we are and what we have? Because believe me, the harvest is plentiful. Twice the number of souls there, 
and the workers are very, very few. So it's not too late to consider joining. I'll do my little plug now. What we're planning to do is not an entire church plant and a kind of colonial takeover, but we are feeling called to bring uh, whoever is feeling called to help resource what is actually a great, beautiful, healthy church uh, in Merston, in South Merston, All Saints. And then the plan and the vision from that is to help them do what they already have been trying to do for a long time, which is start a new community in a local school, start something in a cafe. And actually to join together with all the small churches in Merston. They're desperate to do it, but they're just looking for more equipping and more resourcing. And we've been meeting every week and having our prayer meetings every Monday night, 7.45 in the church centre. Don't be embarrassed if you've not been to one before. There's still first timers coming along. And if it's just curiosity, that's fine. If it's just because you want to pray, but you've got no intention, I don't want you signing up if you've never actually been called. Of course not. But feel free, don't be embarrassed, don't be shy. We had a word in in prayer as we were listening, someone saying, I have a sense there's more people that might be curious but a bit embarrassed to join. That's fine. There's no need to feel like that. Please do feel you can come along. Let me try and sell it to you. Come and struggle, be frustrated, be disappointed, be disillusioned. Enjoy Sunday services which don't run as smoothly as St Mary's do. It's not far off what Jesus' commission was when that story when he sends out 72 disciples and another story when he says, big pep talk, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. I don't think it's going to be quite that bad. So surely, you know, it's not as bad as that. Perhaps we could think about something that we can do, whatever it is that we can offer. Because I think I would also say, come and see the Lord of the harvest at work. People finding faith, people going deeper in their faith. The hungry being fed, peace restored, relationships being healed, chains and cycles of addiction and abuse being broken. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out harvest workers. And of course, this is exactly how we see the kingdom working in the Gospels. Matthew even lays out the trade of some of these people. We know in the Gospels that you've got Peter, Andrew, James and John. They lay down their jobs. They lay down their fishing businesses so that they can follow. You've got Matthew, the tax collector, giving up his job so that he could go and follow Jesus. I wish we knew more about what everyone else was doing. I know there's Simon the Zealot. Zealots were kind of terrorists. (laughs) He gave up his political terrorism. Hallelujah. Um, I don't know if you've got any here today. No? But anyway, (laughs) you know, they, they had things that mattered to them. And then they thought, you know what, this is possibly, probably even more important. So as we conclude, I want to thank some of the people that have given things up to help me in my life. I want to thank the many people who shaped my own life, Jen's life, my wife's life, and my kids' lives, because these are people who choice, chose to participate in some way in Jesus' harvest field. When we were in Woking, our neighbours, Gareth and Karen, invited Jen and me. We weren't particularly ardent church goers. We weren't really church goers at all, frankly. We had little Gabriel, uh, sorry Gabe, no, we had little Gideon and little George, little toddlers. And Gareth and Karen invited us to come along. I want to thank Peter and Claire Harwood. He was the minister and the minister's wife. I want to thank Stephen Shannon, uh, Stephen Sharon, who journeyed with us. I want to thank those who journeyed with us in rebuilding my life. Think of Mike, the head of the men's ministry that helped me through a lot of issues. I think of the people that encouraged me to volunteer, first of all in music and then in the kids' ministry. I want to thank them. And then I want to thank those that invited me to New Wine as well. And I thought, what do I want to go to that for? Isn't it enough I come along to church? But it was a huge breakthrough. I want to thank Anna Martin and Simon Parry, who headed up two huge industries to the nought to fours and the fours to, fours to sevens, where our boys gave their lives to Jesus, where our boys first prayed over us. And the hundreds of teenagers that also volunteer in those huge ministries when there's like 400 little kids in a warehouse bouncing around to give glory to God. I want to thank them. I want to thank those who are among the many led, the many people who led and mentored my kids when they were small and they were growing in their faith. I want to thank Ashley and Dave, Pete and Sophie, great youth workers. I want to thank Johnny Finch, who was 18 years old when he took my eldest boy, Gideon, to, uh, to, and just took him under his wing. Johnny was a fantastic worship leader at the age of 18. He thought, I see that young Gideon plays the piano pretty well for a 12-year-old, and he mentored him. And Gideon's now going to play at New Wine in the big arena to 5,000 people this coming year. 
All these things are links in a chain that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But we bring what we have, and you have no idea of that cascade of effects. I want to thank the countless of, of, of people who were helping us when I was being trained in Southbury in Kent. I want to thank Alan and Sue. I want to thank Len and Rita who showed me how to knock on doors and pray for people. I want to thank Gerald and Pat who taught me how to be a vicar. I want to thank Stephen and Elizabeth. I want to thank Nick and Gillian, Graham and Sheila, Sue, John and Sophie Kirsty, Marion, Lynn and Rod who showed me what servant-hearted ministry was really like. I want to thank those who are mentoring my boys today. I want to thank Lauren, Jamie, Carl, Robert, Rachel, John and Joanna Soper. Again, I'm naming just a few. I want to thank Ian and Carol, John and Coral and all those in my mum and dad's life group at Millmead Baptist in Guildford who visited and served my parents so well in the last few years and months of their life. And at St Mary's Rygate, I'd like to thank... No, I'm not going to do that because that gets embarrassing, doesn't it? But friends, this is what happens. This is what ministry is. It's actually quite simple. You don't even realise you're doing it. But you are called. Pray that the Lord will send out harvest workers. And part of that prayer is, who am I? What are my skills? I might be shy, I might be quiet, I might just be a prayer warrior. I say, just, that's huge. I might be all kinds of things, but if I just sit there soaking up and receiving, I'm only doing a small part of what God is calling me to do, of what Jesus, the Lord of the harvest, is calling me to do. These were all, in my life, obedient people. They experienced that God is love, God is light, God is life. Whatever they had, whoever they were, whatever their personalities, they did something which I am incredibly grateful for. The apostle, sent one, Paul, once said this, by sending Jesus into the world, God was reconciling the world through Jesus. In other words, pulling us back into the life and the community of human beings and precious souls that God has always wanted us to be. God was reconciling the world through Jesus, not counting our sins against us. We are, this is what Paul says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, Christ's representatives, Christ's sent ones, as though God is making his appeal to the world through us. Isn't that incredible? We get to represent God. God who is love, God who is light, God who is life. He puts that message in us and says, I trust you. Do what you can. I've gone there already, and I'll take what you've got. As I conclude, finally, with the words of Jesus. Again, you have a sense of urgency with Jesus the night before he's surrendering his life. And he's thinking, how can I motivate these disciples, these slightly petrified, embarrassed, awkward people that just don't seem to be much use, even after three years of mentoring by the Son of God himself. Jesus says this, my command is this. Look, you know, it comes down to this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. So this is my command. Love each other. The harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out harvest workers into his field. Let's pray. Musicians, do you want to go? Lord, I pray for each person here. I thank you that they acknowledge, they're here because they acknowledge there is something beautiful and wonderful, gracious, kind, forgiving. They acknowledge that you are love, you are light, and you are life. Thank you for the way you've made us exceptional, each one of us. Thank you that you've equipped us with personalities, knowledge, intellect, gifts, talent, all to differing degrees. And you call us your friends. 
So I pray for us as individuals and I pray for us as a church. I thank you for the incredible things that happen all over the place. Too many to mention. The hospitality, the pastoral work, holiday at home, the kids work, girls brigade, the music, the, the musicians, the, lead, the worship leaders, the life group leaders, our wardens, our PCC, our technicians in the church. Those who pray, those who journey, those who mentor. I thank you, Lord, and I pray that you will never let those ministries die out. May they blossom and flourish and grow and be agents of the growth of your kingdom and the size of your harvest. Now, Lord, I pray too for Merstam. I pray for that as a precious community where we long to see even greater things happening. Lord, I thank you for the strength of faith in that community and all the churches that I have, when I, that I see when I meet there and I meet with them. I thank you for the vision that you are the Lord of the harvest and you are going to bring change. Lord, I pray for all of us as we pray that the Lord will send out harvest workers. I pray that we will see your kingdom come here in Rygate, in Red Hill, in Merstham, in the entire region, Lord. I pray that your kingdom will come, that you, the Lord of the harvest, will bring in a great crop of your people, your harvest, your community, your sons, your daughters, those that you have paid such a high price for. May you bring your kingdom, we pray. Amen.